Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the morning service at this British National Party yearly conference. I'd like to express thanks to the organisers of this conference for inviting the Christian Church to be present. It's good for us to be invited to the yearly conference of a British political party. So thank you very much indeed. I'm going to begin our worship service this morning by reading from the Word of God. And if you have your copies with you, you may wish to turn to it. It's from the book of Exodus in the Old Testament, the book of Exodus and chapter 1 and 2. It's quite a long passage. The second book of Moses called Exodus. Now these are the names of the children of Israel who came to Egypt. Each man and his household came with Jacob. Reuben, Simeon, Levi and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun and Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad and Asher. All those who were descendants of Jacob were 70 persons, for Joseph was in Egypt already. And Joseph died, all his brothers and all that generation but the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know of Joseph. And he said to his people, Look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest... They multiply, and it happen in the event of war that they also join our enemies and fight against us and, go up, and so go up out of the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for, for Pharaoh supply cities, Pithom and Ramesses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were in dread of the children of Israel. So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigour. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar, in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. And their service in which they made them serve was with rigour. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the name of one was Shifra and the name of the other Pua. And he said, when you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stools, if it is a son, then you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them but saved the male children alive. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing and saved the male children alive? And the midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women, for they are lively and give birth before the midwives come to them. Therefore God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very mighty. And so it was because the midwives feared God that he provided households for them. So Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. And a man of the house of Levi went and took as wife a daughter of Levi. So the woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. And when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, daubed it with asphalt and pitch, put the child in it, and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens walked along the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, 
she sent her maid to get it. And when the maid opened it, she saw the babe, and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. <clears throat> then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. And the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. So she called his name Moses, saying, Because I drew him out of the water. Now it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out to his brethren and looked at their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way and that way, and when he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And he went, when he went out the second day, behold, two Hebrew men were fighting. And he said to the one who did the wrong, Why are you striking your companion? And he said, Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? So Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. May God add a blessing to the reading of his most holy, infallible and inspired word. May we stand, please, to pray. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and eternal God, we give thee thanks for the history of thy servant Moses. And we would ask thee, O Lord, that as we look at this passage today, from real life, fact and matter, that you will be pleased to draw out the lessons of that history and apply them graciously to our lives. And whilst we ask for this blessing now for the living, we also call to mind, O Lord, remembrance of patriots who have died and who have, get, uh, and who have given much for this cause. And although we do not pray for the dead, for they have no need of our prayers, yet we remember their lives. And we call to mind especially, O Lord, the life of Albert Starmore, Adam Champney, Winifred Undy, Brian Michurton, James Connolly, Edward Hart, Edward Alderson, Timothy Brown. And, O oh Lord, we pray for us who are alive, that we may have faith in thy Son and repentance for our sins, that continuing in this sojourn here, when we may bring forth works glorifying to thee. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Now, there's going to be no hymns this morning, and there's not going to be a collection, because we're very short on time. But there's always next year. Um, what I'd like to speak to you about this morning is from Exodus 2, uh, 2 in chapter 12. Um, Moses slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Moses, there can be little doubt, was the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. In the New Testament, he is both contrasted with and he is compared to our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And the Jews of Christ's day trusted in Moses and said that they believed in his words. And Jesus, 
said of the Jews in his own day, that if you believed Moses' words, then you would trust in, of, in whom Moses wrote, namely Jesus himself. The New Testament in the Gospel of John tells us that the law came by Moses, but the completion of the law, the end of the law has come. Grace and truth has come by Jesus Christ himself. And Christ said of Moses, when he controverted the Pharisees, he said, Moses rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and he was glad. Even today, the nation of the Jews glory in Moses, especially the Orthodox religious Jews. And they're very proud of the fact that the law, the Mosaic law, was given to them and them alone through Moses. The right of circumcision, the sign of God's favour and of God's blessing, the temple at Jerusalem, and indeed the promised land surrounding the town of Jerusalem. A land not flowing with oil, but flowing with milk and honey, temporal signs of God's spiritual blessing. But then things went wrong. And 2,000 years, as the Old Testament says, they were thrown out of the land for disobedience by the Roman Emperor Vespasian. That was foretold by Jesus and also in the Old Testament. Recently, they've been restored to, the la to that land. And some of the issues that are raised currently kind of bring the Old Testament to life and make it seem like today's news. But we're looking at a passage of the Old Testament which is very, very early indeed. We're looking at a passage of the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, the second book of the Bible, which is long before Vespasian and Rome. It's long before the Greeks. It's long before the empire of the Medes and Persians. An empire which stretched from Kazakhstan to Ethiopia and from Pakistan to Greece. We're looking before that era, we're looking before the era of the Babylonians and of the Assyrians and of the Hittites, a people we now know only through excavation and what the Bible says. We're looking before that period. We're looking at the period of the foundation of civilization in ancient Egypt, a time even before the Jews first moved into Canaan. We're looking at a time within about 800 years of the destruction of the Tower of Babel when God dispersed the nations or the families into every single continent. Mankind did not emerge from Africa. Mankind got off of a boat on Mount Ararat in Armenia. And if you look at all the myths and legends and histories of the ancient cultures to this time, not simply in the Bible, you come across a situation of small groups of heroic human beings travelling throughout the earth in a degraded technological state brought about by their dispersion. A kind of small groups of heroic human beings who are rapidly establishing ancient and advanced cultures, but cultures also which are dreadfully depraved in moral terms. We have the example of the cities of the plain, where the Dead Sea is now, the example of Sodom and Gomorrah. But it's not simply that kind of evil and wickedness. Throughout every human race and nation, you had tremendous cruelty, you had child sacrifice, and you had slavery. And all this has been confirmed, if it needs confirming at all, by the archaeologist, what he has found, what his spade and what his pickaxe has discovered, certifying and verifying the Bible not simply as a religious book, but as in fact a history book, a history of the early earth a history of early mankind, a history of man in darkness. But God is still there. He chooses a nation, which is a family. He chooses Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, 
to bear his light, to be his favoured ones, and ultimately to bring his favour through them to all of us. The nation, by the time of Joseph, had reached 70 souls. By the time they moved from Canaan down to Egypt, they were 70, and in Egypt God brought them there to receive succour and sustenance during a worldwide famine. You may recall how Joseph, one of the 12 sons of Israel, that's the other name for Jacob, Jacob means twister, Israel means I have prevailed with God, uh, the twelve sons, Joseph had been sent down to Egypt by the betrayal of his brothers. But it wasn't simply his brothers who'd sent him down to Egypt. God was working through the treason of his brothers to prepare a safe haven for the ancient people of God. And when they went down to Egypt, the Egyptians regarded them as an abomination because they were shepherds. And the uh, Egyptians looked down on shepherds culturally. And in process of time, in process of 400 years, they multiplied rapidly and, and advanced to a stage of tens of thousands. But in economic terms, they became uh, degraded. They became slaves. They were the chosen race, but they were a slave nation. Egypt was not their home. It was their land of sojourn. Their hotel, well, not quite. It was also the house of bondage. So great was their suffering that they began to cry to God, the God of their fathers. They began to cry to God, Oh God, come down and save us. Oh God, deliver us. Exodus 2 and verse 22. And that is precisely what God, the God of their fathers, began to do for his ancient people. And he did it through the life, through the traumas, and through the testing of his four-appointed servant, Moses, drawn from the water. The story of Moses is itself a picture <clears throat> of the way that God moves in nations. It's a picture of the way that God moves in individuals. It's a picture of the way that God moves in families to bring about his purpose and his deliverance and his accomplishment for his people. But it is a purpose that we cannot always, indeed, it is a purpose that we can scarcely ever see during the course of it actually unfolding. Exodus 1 and verse 8, a king arose in Egypt who knew not the story of Joseph. Joseph's generation had passed away. A people ignorant of their history, curse, bring a curse upon their present. How wonderfully God had wrought for both the Jews and the Egyptians in times past through those wonderful dreams of Joseph. The Hebrew slave who became a co-ruler of Egypt and therefore a source of blessing to both the Egyptians and the Hebrews. The children of so signal a deliverance were by now, by their great growth in numbers in the midst of the Egyptians, because the Egyptians had forgotten the history, the children of Israel were now deemed a danger to the people of Egypt. They might join with Egypt's enemies and so leave Egypt. The Egyptians must have been aware of the Hebrew belief in a promised land to the east in Canaan. But their selfish slave economy mustn't be threatened. The Hebrews, said the Egyptians, they must be weakened. They must be put to hard labour. Have you ever wondered at the glories of ancient Egypt? Have you ever wondered at the pyramids, the massive cities, the impressive tombs, the Valley of the Kings? We must all be in awe of these ancient glories. Well, they date, generally speaking, from the time of the Hebrew sojourn in Egypt. And that's why in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, the preface to the Ten Commandments given, given to the Jews reminds them of this time and they read it even today. 
The preface for the Ten Commandments says, I am the Lord, thy God, which have brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods alongside of me. What he's telling them is that God's power and purpose, only God's power and purpose can deliver them from the clutches of an oppressing people. A deliverance that is, that is referred to here in the preface to the Ten Commandments. A deliverance that brought the favoured race out of the house of bondage and they were not to have any connection with the vile abominations of the heathen. You shall have none other gods alongside of me, not even alongside of me, let alone in place of me. The true God who made the heaven and the earth is our husband and we are to have none alongside him. We are to be true to our husband, our God and Lord. Jesus said in the, the, the New Testament that this is the first and the greatest commandment. But the Egyptian plan to weaken the Israelites didn't work. The more they oppressed the children of Israel, the more the children of Israel multiplied. So a new scheme had to be invented. It was the first attempted genocide of the Jews. There is another one mentioned later in the Old Testament, much later, during the time of the Empire of the Medes and the Persians. The empire that in fact attacked Greece in 500 BC. The empire that was defeated by the Greeks at Marathon, Salamis and Plataea. The empire whose defeat really marks the beginning of secular European history. There was an attempted genocide of the Jews by that empire. It was an internationalist empire. And it's referred to in the book of Esther. We have much to learn from it. It was, f But we also have much to learn from the, the attempted genocide that's recorded in the book of Exodus. Let's see how that attempted genocide was thwarted. First of all, it was thwarted by, of all folk, the Hebrew midwives, the women. We have a lot to learn here. In weakness, we have strength. It was the women at work. They feared God much more than they feared the king. And they beguiled the king as to the cause of why they couldn't kill the Hebrew boys. And God, far from punishing them, honoured them. He gave them houses to live in. Praise God for those midwives. Jesus said much later in Luke 6 and verse 9, It is better to save life than to destroy it. And what this teaches us is that duties to kings, duties to rulers, duties to politicians, duties to orders and states, and duties to laws have limits. There is a higher law that we must obey rather than some of the foul and disgusting laws that are being currently passed by an abomination parliament. Note then the manner of the deliverance that God is bringing to his people. His deliverance is a process. It is a process. It's not one event, however mighty. It is a process. It takes time. It is a gradual process. Almost unworthy of note, except in the immediate and personal circumstances of the lives of God's small people. See what God is about to do, and by such humble beginnings, he is about to begin to deliver a nation, and yet he does so through the forlorn yearnings and the domestic cries <clears throat> of a mother who is ready to give up on the deliverance of her newborn baby boy. She has made a boat or ark of bulrushes, and she has daubed it with waterproof pitch <clears throat> to set the baby boy adrift. She had given up hope of herself as being the means to deliver her son. When we give up hope in any cause, however great, 
And however humane that cause is, we must nonetheless remind ourselves that there is one who is greater than all our resources. And as Paul says in Ephesians 3 and verse 20, he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Note also now how God works through the very oppressors, the enemies of the children of Israel. As the plot much later in the book of Esther to wipe out God's people only led to God's people wiping out their opponents, so much earlier in this book of Exodus, it is the daughter of the very Pharaoh who had ordered the destruction of the Hebrew race, who now not only spares one of its baby boys, but the very baby boy for appointed by God to be that nation's deliverer. God now works through the very feelings of humaneness and compassion that he has implanted in every soul and conscience. Pharaoh's daughter hears the cry <clears throat> of the Hebrew baby boy and has compassion upon him. And because she is the king's daughter, the baby boy of the Hebrews is spared. And because nursing an infant is far too low a task for a mighty princess, she seeks a, a nurse. And the nurse chosen and paid for the job is his very own mother. It doesn't stop there. The connection and tie between the princess of Egypt and the baby boy grows. The tie of affection and love between the princess of Egypt, Pharaoh's daughter, and the Hebrew baby boy becomes so strong that the lad, as he grows up, becomes her son, adopted not only into the Egyptian race, but into the very royal house of the Pharaoh who had sought to kill the Hebrews. What a wonderful turnaround. God is using his enemies. But there was one outward indication left of his origin. One outward indication left of his origin. His name. She called him Moses, for he was drawn out of the water. Of course he was a Hebrew, and remained so by physical descent. Had his mother instilled some knowledge of his Hebrew nationality into him? Doubtless she had, but his yearnings for his own kin and kind were of a piece with nature and not nurture. Nurture had drawn him to the life of Egypt, but nature drew him back to his real orbit, his brethren. He had a racial orientation of his own. It's there in the Bible. Get used to it, which is perfectly normal and natural. He chose to visit his brethren despite his high rank and despite their lowly estate and despite the danger such a connection must pose to the maintenance of his status in the court of the Pharaoh. Just like adopted children when they grow older want to discover and make contact with their real mum or dad, so Moses sought communion with his real and not his supposed people. You can call this race, if you like, and you would be right. Or you can call it roots, and you would be equally right. Why do we, therefore, encouraged by the BBC, despise our roots when it comes to our own race, but not when it comes to other people's races? Is that equality? Moses went down to visit his brethren. And he did so on two occasions. And on each occasion, as God's coming deliverer of God's ancient people, Moses had something to learn. The thing that he had to learn from his first visit was that his own people were being oppressed by his adopted race. He looked at their burdens. He saw them. He saw how they suffered at the hands of his privileged adopted people. And in particular, he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own blood. There comes a breaking point for us all. That enraged and incensed Moses so much, despite his political 
<clears throat> situation and privileged position that he took a political action. He looked this way and that way. He slew the Egyptian and he buried him in the sand. His action was one of direct action. It was one of self-defence. It was one of self-defence of his own brethren. He slew an Egyptian and then he buried him in the sand. Was he a murderer or was he acting in the private defence of himself, property or another? He was aware, says the New Testament, that he was called by God to deliver the children of Israel. That's, that's in Acts 7 and 25. And he supposed that this was the way to do it. In obedience to that inward call that he genuinely felt and which in and of itself was quite valid. But the inward call of God to a person and the compulsion of God to a person to get involved in some kind of work is a very direct and it's a very private matter. No one else may take notice of it. No one else may have an inkling that it has come about in the life of another. God had moved upon Moses, the instrument of the deliverance of his people. But God, it seems, had not given notice of this to his people themselves, or if he had, they had not taken notice. That's the first thing that we can draw from his first visit. In his second visit to his brethren, we have more to learn. In his second visit, Moses must have been bitterly disappointed with his own people. In spite of them being oppressed by the Egyptians, they, his people, the Hebrews, are in dispute among themselves. It is not only the Egyptians who are racially abusing the Hebrews, their very own are exploiting and abusing them as well. Moses appeals to their common nationality to reconcile them, but receives a stiff and twofold rebuke. Instead of being welcomed as a fellow national, a defender of his kin, and a man of righteousness, courage and justice, he is queried as to his right to make assessment of such issues. He, they, they say to him, who made you a ruler over us? And it is made known to him that his deed of a week or so ago in slaying an Egyptian and in burying him in the sand is out. No one has been looking out for the personal interests of Moses. No one. Not even those who are especially the beneficiaries of his courage. This is a hard blow. His calling to those whom he, he, he is to deliver has been rejected not by God, the issuer of the call, but by the beneficiaries of that call. For the moment at least, and, as it turns out, for many years and decades ahead, the issuance of the call of God to Moses now leads to his flight, both from the land and people of his adoption and for the race of kith and kin on which he had ventured all. He is now cast out from all and he is as forlorn and forsaken as his mother had been 20 years before, moving to a heathen tribe, the Midianites. This is where his patriotism, this is where his nationalism, this is where his moral integrity has brought him. It is a low point in the life of God's chosen deliverer. It is just as low as the point which his mother had experienced when she felt compelled to build that ark for him as a baby and set him loose on the tides of the Nile. I just wonder where, if that is your position now, be sure that just as Moses' mother was not alone in God's process and that Moses himself was not alone either, as later events made known, so neither will you be in your trial. Moses was being readied. He had the line of descent from Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. He had the line of culture and knowledge, wisdom and connection with the house of Pharaoh's daughter. 
But he needed something far more important and crucial than either of these two things, important though each of them were. He needed the line. <coughs> he needed the line of faith and patience, patient endurance. And that could only come with trial and testing. How long the years must have seemed for him in the land of Midian, as they had done in the dungeon and circumstances for Joseph 400 years before. How often he must have thought what it was all about and what had become of him and how, long, how often he must have tried to make sense of his life and all that had happened. Moses, it says, at the end of this period, however, was content to be with the priest of Midian. Contentment. He took a wife and begat two sons. Meanwhile, the nation that had rejected him, the nation that had rejected the one called, had to undergo the consequences and the impoverishment which that rejection involved. And the one called and rejected and the one currently in exile had to do the same as well. We read in Exodus 3 and verse 1 that the prince of Egypt, the former prince of Egypt, Moses, the one drawn from the bulrushes, was what? Doing great things, fulfilling his calling, being a great man and deliverer? No, he was but a former prince of great Egypt. He was tending a flock of sheep to a heathen priest, but he was content. He was content. You see, the accomplishment of God's plan in our lives is a cumulative, drawn-out process. He was content where he was, tending sheep, and it was then that the angel of God the messenger of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost appeared to him in a flame in a bush that could not be consumed. Moses, having already received many decades ago the inward call to be God's servant, is now given by God the actual commission. Go back into Egypt and be the deliverer of my people. Deliverance is a process, and we must expect that in the lives of ourselves and in the lives of our nation. Therefore, as the writer to the Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 says, Therefore let us with patience endure the race that is set before us. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for the word of God, which is a light unto our path and a lamp unto our feet. Give us grace, we pray, to learn more, that the fullness of thy word may enrich and encourage us in these days of treachery and treason. And now that may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost rest upon us and abide with us now and evermore. Amen.